Gregory um, graduated from UNH, and he studied under instructors Mark Smith, Thomas Williams, and Theodore Wiesner. He worked for nearly two decades on a local daily newspaper and highlights his career were, were the highlight of his career were interviewing shock rocker Alice Cooper, which totally would have been who just awesome. had a birthday uh, yes. oh, really? a couple of days ago. And B -mo <laughs> movie icon. What is B movie icon? Uh, Bad movie? No, yeah. just like uh, <laughs> low budget horror movies usually. Oh, oh uh, horror, yeah, uh, Bruce Campbell. <laughs> So yeah. I'd have to do more research. Who also was in a Hallmark movie the other night. We saw him on TV in a Hallmark he movie. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, right. he's fun. So we'll say a movie then. <laughs> but you've always been enchanted by horror and horror yes. books and movies. Mm -hmm. And I hope you do talk about that. I, I don't uh, want to perseverate. But <laughs> one of your favorite authors is Stephen King. You list him. And I can't even read Stephen King. Some of his things I can because they're not too scary, mm -hmm. but I find him one of the best writers out there, his he way is. with words, yeah. and I love reading him, but then I get too scared and I <laughs> can't read it so, um, <clears throat> Gregory lives in Dover in a 1700s colonial mm -hmm. with his wife, and I want to know if it's haunted. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if it's haunted. Um, there are bats in the basement, and there are mice in the attic. Um, and we often hear things crawling in the walls. I'm hoping those are mice, but who knows what they, they are. They probably are. Bats and mice are fine. <laughs> so tell me how to pronounce your last name. Uh, Bastinelli. Bastinelli. Or so well, Bastianelli, as they say in Italy. <laughs> okay. All right. Welcome, Gregory. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm also a member of the New England Horror Writers and the Horror Writers Association, which is an international association of fellow horror writers. Um, and I'm the author of four books at the moment. Um, Joker's Club was my first book. Uh, then Looney's uh, was my second one. Uh, Looney's is less horror, more of a dark mystery, uh, creepy kind of mystery. So if you if you're shy away from horror, that's uh, a good alternative. Uh, Snowball uh, was my third book. And then my newest book just came out uh, last year, uh, less than a year ago, uh, Shadow Flicker. And that one is actually set on an island off the coast of Maine, a mysterious island. Um, now, when I do, uh, I do a lot of events uh, around uh, the Northeast and uh, a lot of sometimes tr uh, book events and uh, conventions and things like that and I'll have I'll have my table of books set up like this and people will come up and they'll say oh well what kind of books are these and I say well I, I'm a horror writer these are horror novels and they of course the instant reaction is like Sharon oh I can't I can't read that no that's not that's not for me so they'd walk away so I said, well, I need a, a, a different tactic. So, so they come up to me and they say, oh, what kind of books do you write? And I say, well, what kind of books do you read? And, they, and someone might say, um, well, I like a good like, psychological thriller. I say, oh, Joker's Club. That's a nice psychological thriller, you know. Or if they say, oh, I like a, like a murder mystery. I say, oh, perfect, loonies, there's a murder mystery. And if they say, uh, oh, I like a good suspense story. Uh, well, Shadow Flicker is very suspenseful. Yeah, you might like that. And if they say, you know, oh, I like a romance, <laughs> I got nothing for you. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon will have to point you out to the uh, Nora Roberts section in the in the in the library, and you can find all the romance you need. Yes, no romance there. Um, yeah, so people people say they don't like to read horror, but um, horror is. It's kind of a broad field, and sometimes people have misconceptions of what horror is. Um, I mean, James Patterson's almost as popular as Nora Roberts, <laughs> and writes as many books as, as she does, but uh, people love his books, but he's always writing about serial killers and stuff, and so that's some pretty horrific stuff, but people don't lump, lump him in as a horror writer, because he's not a horror writer, but it, he, he can write some pretty gruesome stuff as well. Um, and. Uh, uh, one of my favorite writers growing up was Ray Bradbury, and though he's mostly known as a science fiction author, he started out writing a lot of horror stories. His novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes, is one of my all-time favorite horror novels. 
uh, he, he wrote a short story called The October Game, which is incredibly gruesome, and, and you wouldn't think a kind old man like Ray Bradbury would have written something like that. Um, but he also wrote Dandelion Wine, which is a nice little tale of a one summer in the life of a, it's a very nostalgic story of a summer in the life of a, of a young boy in his small town. Um, but that small town also happens to have a uh, uh, serial killer known as the Lonely One who stalks women and, and, and kills them. So, uh, so this, this horror, can be, horror can be everywhere. And they say that, um, uh, of course, we all know the little north of here, Stephen King, who writes more than just horror, but he's known as the king of horror. And, uh, but there's a lot of books that he's written that's not really horror, but as Sharon says, people sometimes are afraid to, to tackle his books because they're afraid of being too, uh, too frightened. Um, but uh, they say that uh, horror uh, kind of ebbs and flows in popularity, and often it uh, it's gets popular during like bad times. Um, and uh, uh, you can look at the, you know, the news pick up a uh, turn on the TV news and you see horrible things all the time and they say people turn to to horror to escape reality because we all see the horrible things on the news and in the newspaper for those of you who still remember newspapers <laughs> and um, uh, things that are going on in Ukraine and in Turkey right now um, horrible things so people turn to horror as an escape and it's kind of like it's kind of like when people go to um, amusement parks you know, people go to amusement parks to have a good time, but what, what are some of the most popular rides at amusement parks, the ones that thrill you? Uh, if you go down to uh, Disney World and you go, the most popular rides are all those thrill rides. Uh, you know, uh, Space Mountain, um, the Haunted Mansion, the Tower of Terror, It's a Small World, all the really scary rides. <laughs> now, um, I... Uh, just north of here, not quite as north as far north as where Mr. King lives, but north here in Saco, um, there's an amusement park called Fun Town. And it's Fun Town where people go to have fun. Um, but they also have um, one of those old wooden ro ro roller coasters. Now, when I go to amusement parks, those old style wooden roller coasters are my favorite thing, in addition to fun houses. But um, I think it's because they sound so rickety when you're, you're riding on them and you think they're going to fall apart at any minute. And, and, and you think that, you kind of wonder how often does like a maintenance guy go and check all the nuts on all those bolts, uh, uh, thousands of bolts that are holding all those wooden planks together holding up that roller coaster, you know, do they check that like every day or every other day, once a week? I don't know, because when you're riding on one of those, they, they feel like they're going to fall apart. And, uh, and, and when I went to Fun Town with a couple, my grandchildren a couple of summers ago, uh, we went on the wooden roller coaster, the two oldest one, and I went on. So they sat in a seat together. I had to sit in a seat by myself. And, so, and as it's going up the first hill, uh, there was a couple of like 11, 12-year-old girls sitting in front of me, and they were going up the, the first big hill, and one of them turned around and looked at me and must have noticed I was gripping the safety bar really tight because she goes, don't worry, it's not that scary. And I felt better. <laughs> but she lied. <laughs> and as it went over that first hill and started going down its turns and twists, I was gripping that thing like death was uh, coming for me. And uh, grateful when it finally came to a stop and I got off. But it, you get off those rides like that and you have a smile on your face. And why is that? Because you didn't die. <laughs> and and that's, why, that's why people love those rides, because you didn't die. And when you, when you uh, see all the things that are happening in, 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 the, in the world, the bad things, you, or you read even James Patterson's book, those things can happen. These things can't happen. And that's what makes horror fun. They may be scary, they may be frightening, but they can't happen. So they're, they're safe. So my mother, like Sharon, my mother doesn't like to read Stephen King, and she would never read a Stephen King book. And... Um, she lives in, a, in the winter. She's in the mobile home park down in, in uh, Florida. And they have a, a, a laundry center uh, in the park. And uh, people leave books out there for all the residents of the park to share. So she, um, she'd go in there and browse through the books. And there's 
an endless number of James Patterson, Nora Roberts books, of course, but one day this Pickens must have been slim because she brought home a Stephen King book. And it was The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon. Not one of his scariest books, but there's some moments in that that are a little frightening. And, and she loved it. She told me, she said, wow, I read a Stephen King book. I said, wow, that's awesome. She said, uh, it was great. I said, oh, you should read another one of his books. Oh, no, no, he's too scary. <laughs> but, but she loved it. So, and so she, she, reads, she reads my books. And uh, not just because she's my mother, I hope, that she actually says she likes them. She read Joker's Club. She said she loved it. And then when Loonies came out, she read that. She said she loved it. And then when Snowball came out, she read that. And she said, I loved it until it got weird. <laughs> and I, I do have to admit, these books are going to get weird. There's no getting around that. Um, that's, that's what makes them fun, though. Now, Charles Dickens, uh, who wrote A Christmas Carol, that's a nice uh, heartwarming story of uh, Christmas, but it's full of ghosts. Well, my novel Snowball is a Christmas story full of ghosts, but no one would call it heartwarming, not at all. Um, so uh, my newest book, Shadow Flicker, as I said, just came out last year. Uh, it's set uh, off the coast of uh, Maine on an island, and it's... It's, it's probably less horror than some of the others. It's, I actually call it more of a sort of a, a, a weird, like my mother described, a weird story. Um, it has element, maybe some elements of horror, but some elements of mystery and uh, strange occurrences. And um, a lot of times when, I, when some of the reviews came out, of course, uh, Publishers Weekly said it's a dark, disturbing treat. Um, some, some reviewers refer to it as uh, a sci-fi thriller. Some use it, refer to it as an eco-thriller because it involves wind turbines. Um, uh, one reviewer probably described it, my, my favorite way of describing it, they refer to it as a speculative mystery. And I kind of like that. So I said, yeah, it's a speculative mystery. And, but it gets weird. It gets really weird at some point. Um, so um, I know that uh, my original intention was I thought, well, since that's my newest book, maybe I should read something from it. Uh, it's, we've all been, it's, it takes place in the summer, a nice hot summer off the coast of Maine. And I figured, well, you know, we've had these frigid days recently. It's pretty cold tonight. There might be some snow later. I said, maybe I should, you know, read something from that to kind of warm you up, make you feel a little comfortable. Then I thought, no, I'm going to read from Snowball because I want to make you uncomfortable because that's what I do. I make pe people uncomfortable. So I'm going to read a little uh, selection from Snowball. So keep your mittens on. Um, so the basis of this story is there's a group of travelers on Christmas Eve uh, trying to get home and they're on a highway, a, a lonely stretch of highway. And uh, there's a blizzard, Christmas Eve blizzard. And they're uh, struggling in their vehicles, trying to get, uh, trying to get home. And uh, there's uh, a set of occurrences that happens on the highway, and a, a, a tractor trailer truck ends up jackknife, and all these vehicles kind of get stuck behind it, and then they, they can't go anywhere. They're stuck in their cars. They, a couple of them get out to try to see what's going on and if, if there's a way to get, get around this mess, but there isn't. They, they end up sitting in their cars, and they uh, uh, just trying to wonder if, if help is going to come. And uh, they realize, uh, eventually they realize that there's some strange things besides the storm that's going on out there. Uh, that's maybe even worse than the storm that they're trapped in. But the scene I'm going to read, um, two of the characters, two, uh, one of them has picked up his buddy at Logan Airport and driving him back home. He flew in from California. And he, um, so they, the two of them, they're childhood lifelong friends. Uh, one's named Graham and one's named Clark. And so they're stuck with all these other people, you know, stuck in their car. And at one point, uh, they see a naked man running by the, their car in the snow. So that's where this, this scene picks up. Um, uh, uh, Graham zipped up his jacket as he and Clark got out of the car. 
The wind hit him the moment he stepped out and he looked over the roof of his car at Clark, who was dipping his head and holding up one hand to shield his face. Clark yelled something as he came around to Graham's side. What? Graham yelled back, though the words were shoved back into his mouth by the wind, almost gagging him. Do you see him? Clark repeated. Graham shook his head. It was hard to see anything in the mist created by the swirling snow. The man had been running straight down the middle of the highway in the opposite direction from the way they had come. Graham could barely see the outlines of snow-covered vehicles, including a large truck or something. He looked down at footprints the man had left behind, already being wiped away by the storm winds. This way, Graham yelled, pointing south, the direction the man had been running. Pulling the collar of his coat up around his chin to provide some protection, Graham led the way, clock sticking close by as they waded through the drifts. His feet were already chilled, he couldn't imagine what the naked man felt like. Or was he so crazy he didn't feel anything at all, Graham wondered. Graham wondered what had compelled the man to strip and run outside, but insanity was the only explanation. He had seemed normal when Graham had spoken to him earlier, a little rude, but otherwise sane. The vehicles before them had their lights on, but snow covered the headlamps, creating an eerie muted glow. The car directly behind his was a hatchback, but Graham couldn't see anyone inside. The car was nearly buried, and he wondered if the occupants had abandoned it. But that wouldn't make much sense. There was nowhere to go. So where was the naked man going? Graham turned to look behind him to make sure Clark was still there. His friend was so close he was practically on top of him, but Graham had barely felt his presence. It was as if the wind and snow forced a barrier between them. Clark's clothing was even less practical than his own, and Graham thought about sending him back to the car. He had come from California totally unprepared for this onslaught, but Graham himself hadn't expected to be out in the elements. He should have been wiser. He turned back into the wind and proceeded, passing a minivan. A woman's distraught face looked out a snowy window by the driver's seat. Graham thought about stopping to check on her, but she was probably nice and warm and he was freezing his ass off. If he stopped now, he wouldn't be able to keep going. His pant legs were soaked from the wet snow and frozen stiff, making each stride a struggle. As he passed the minivan, a couple of kids peered out from the middle seat of the van. He couldn't even tell their genders from behind the frosted glass, but he couldn't help wonder <clears throat> what they were doing out this night. They should be home awaiting Christmas morning like his girls were. After the minivan, there was a stretch of open highway, snow drifts almost up to his waist. Graham didn't know how much farther they should go. There was no sign of the naked man. There was really no place to go unless he ran off into the woods that lined both sides of the highway. Graham wasn't sure how far back it was to the last exit. He continued looking back every few seconds to, to see clock still behind. Each step Graham took sank into the snow. His toes were numb as well as his face. The cold bit into his body. This was hopeless. A large RV loomed before them, dark. Maybe its occupants had bedded down for the night waiting out the storm. That would be a nice place to be with all the comforts at home. Graham wished he were home. Wished he had never gone to pick Clark up at the airport. Damn, Natalie was right. She had told him to wear a heavier jacket, but he assured her he wouldn't be getting out of the car much. How wrong that turned out to be. He should have stayed home with his girls. It occurred to him that he'd forgotten to kiss his girls goodbye before he left for the airport, thinking he wouldn't be gone long. He told himself that the, that was the first thing he was going to do when he got home tonight, or whenever it ended up happening. This is senseless, Graham thought, stopping after they passed the RV. Ahead was a darkened station wagon. He leaned up against it and peered inside. Its engine wasn't running like those of some of the other vehicles. The interior was dark and empty. Another driver must have decided to abandon his car and march out, he figured. He straightened and looked past the station wagon to the empty highway behind it, nothing but white. Something bumped him, and he turned to see Clark, who had stumbled into him. I can't go, Clark struggled speaking. His face was red, his eyebrows and eyelashes crusted with snow. His friend was suffering, and Clark knew it was, and Graham knew it was pointless worrying about the naked man now. If the elements were having this much effect on Clark, then there could be no hope for the other idiot. We'll go back, Clark yelled into, Graham yelled into Clark's ear and saw some relief on his friend's face. He grabbed his friend's arm, trying to turn him around to go in the other direction. That was when he heard a bell ringing. Graham looked behind him and saw a shadowy figure lurching out of the distant mist. It staggered back and forth, buffeted by the wind, one arm raised and ringing a bell. 
The tones penetrated the howl of the wind to reach him. It wasn't the naked man, for this figure wore a long coat and a visored cap. Though he could tell it was a man, Graham saw long hair beneath the cap falling to the man's shoulders. The figure stopped and stood still. Maybe he had spotted him, Graham thought, or maybe he just couldn't get, go any farther. The man kept ringing the bell. Stay here, Graham yelled into Clark's ear. His friend nodded. He leaned Clark up against the station wagon, afraid he wouldn't be able to stand on his own. Once he was sure Clark was set, Graham headed toward the bell ringer, struggling through the drifts. Though the man was not that far away, it seemed to take forever to reach him. Graham wished the man had made at least more of an effort to meet him halfway. But the way the guy kept ringing the bell gave him the impression he might not have even seen Graham at all. It was as if he was ringing the bell for help to come to him. When Graham reached the man, he grabbed him by the shoulders, staring into a face frozen by the icy wind, or maybe just fear itself. The man looked catatonic. He kept ringing the bell. The man had a stubbled chin and flattened nose. His coat and hat were part of a Salvation Army uniform. His long hair was saturated with icy strands. He stared past Graham as if not realizing he stood right in front of him. Graham shook him by the shoulders and the man's eyes rolled to meet his. You can stop now, Graham yelled. You're okay. The man was silent, eyes narrowing as if trying to comprehend what Graham was saying. What? The man finally asked. I said you can stop. The man looked still look confused. Stop? Yes, Graham said. You can stop ringing the damn bell. The man looked down at his extended right arm as if not even realizing he was holding the metal object. Oh, he finally said. Did you see anyone else back there? Graham asked through chattering teeth, wondering if he had seen the naked man. The Salvation Army man looked back into the white wasteland behind them. He shook his head. Ain't nothing back there. Is that your car? Graham asked, pointing back at the station wagon. The man nodded. Let's get you back inside it. He grabbed hold of the man's left arm and started to lead him, but the man did not move. Ran out of gas, the man said. No heat. Graham nodded, trying to catch his breath. The man must have tried walking out. Did you see anything, he asked the man, wondering where the exit behind them was. How far did you get? The man's face stiffened. We ain't where we think we are. There was that look of fear in his eyes. Graham wondered if this man had been driven mad too. Come with us, he said, figuring he could bring him back to their car. He led the man to where Clark still leaned against the station wagon. His friend was covered in snow, almost blending in with the vehicle. Clark grinned when he saw the two of them, as if grateful not to be alone. Graham tried to lead the pair back the way they had come, not realizing how far they had traveled from his car. Clark stumbled and fell down into the snow. He lay there, not making an effort to get up. Graham let go of the Salvation Army man's arm and bent down, grabbing a hold of Clark and trying to lift him. His friend didn't move, as if content to lie in the snow until it buried him. Most of Graham's body was numb and with cold, and he now worried none of them would be able to make it back to his car. He believed he could make it himself, but not if he had to drag these two. But he couldn't just leave them. He needed help. Exasperated and almost at the point of desperation, Clark thought of just saving himself. So, uh, yes, uh, it's cold outside, and uh, I hope that didn't make you feel any worse. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to just open up to any questions anyone might have. Yes. Are all your books written like, up here, like around here? Uh, uh, yes, they actually, yeah. um, my first three are all set in New Hampshire, and Shadow Flicker, like I mentioned, is set uh, off the coast of Maine on a, on a little, tiny little island. Did you read, I mean, write that book? Um, uh, yes, I did. Um, I yes, I did. <laughs> because we all can relate to it. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly can. I I actually, you know, when I when I had planned to write this book, I, I I just thought of all the miserable winters I've experienced in my life in New England, and and try to put as as much of that as I could into the book. Um, every every bit of cold, freezing day, and uh, bad experience, and, and a hellish winter that you can imagine. It all went into this. <laughs> How long does it take you usually to write um, a book? It can vary. Um, roughly, I think roughly about nine months, about as long as it takes to make a baby, have a baby. Um, but it can vary. Sometimes I've written um, 
I think uh, one of them I wrote in only about six months. Uh, some, some have taken as long as a year, but anywhere from nine months to a year. But that's just the, f the first draft. Then, then the rewriting process begins, and, and that can uh, take a little longer. Are you a full-time author? Or you I am not. Uh, only uh, people like Stephen King, James Patterson, and Nora Roberts can afford to be full-time authors because <laughs> they sell a lot more books. Uh, but uh, uh, so no, I, uh, I have a regular job during the day and then I do my writing at night, which, which makes it difficult. Uh, when, when COVID hit and um, uh, my office shut down for a, f a few months, um, I was like, wow, now I'm a full-time writer. And I was, I was uh, writing and I, I finished up um, one of my manuscripts and um, I, think it was, I think it was Shadow Flicker. And then I, I, after I was done, I thought, okay, now I'm going to take, you know, usually when I get done a book, I like to take a little little break and, and uh, decompress. But uh, I was so excited at being able to just get up every morning and not go to work and, and write. So I, I, and I had an idea for a really uh, a, a great book idea, so I wanted to jump right on it. So after I finished, I was all done with Shadow Flick with all the rewrites and everything, I said, oh, uh, I said, I'm going to just jump into another book. So I started writing another book. And a week later, work called. I said, OK, come down back to work. And I'm like, no, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> but I had to go back to work. So, But, but if I sell a million books, I, I, can, I can become a full-time writer. So I'm on the million book march. I did my part. Yeah, yep, there you go. <laughs> and all these books are available for purchase. And I, I do, I'm able to take credit card payments as well. <laughs> can we buy these directly from you? Or do we have you can buy them from me tonight. If not, they're available at, uh, there's some local sh uh, stores in the area that carry them. Uh, Water Street Books in Exeter carries them. Uh, the Book Tenders in York, I don't know if anyone's been there. It's, it's just a brand new bookstore that opened up in uh, this last summer, beginning of last summer. Um, actually, I think they opened up in August of last year. So uh, they carry my books. In fact, I stopped in there one day and, and signed a bunch of copies. So they actually have signed copies of some of my books. Uh, Jetpack Comics in Rochester also uh, carries them. And, um, are they on Amazon? They are on Amazon as well, yes. Yeah. If you want to help that guy sh shoot his rockets up into the sky, you know. <laughs> but no, yes, they are available on Amazon. Um, I also have a website. It's just my name, GregoryBastinelli.com. And on my website, I actually have links uh, to purchase the books, both through Amazon, through Water Street, uh, and through, uh, there's, another, uh, there's another online site called bookshop.org, which I don't know if you're familiar with that. Are you, Sharon? Have you? Yeah, that's a great uh, uh, website, because what they do is all the, most of the proceeds, f uh, when you buy books off bookshop.org, they distribute it amongst independent bookstores throughout the country. And there's two ways you can buy books through them. You can just, you can just search for a particular store that you like, and you can, you can uh, buy the book through that store. Bookshop.org does all the packaging, shipping, and everything. The bookstore gets the money. Or if you don't have a particular bookstore, or the bookstore you like to patronize doesn't, isn't uh, linked with bookshop.org, they just, all the money goes into a general fund and they just distribute it randomly among independent bookstores. So it's a great way to support independent bookstores, which I'm always all about. Yes, sir. Yeah, you, you used that metaphor about nine month pregnancy. I mean, is the birth of a book sort of like pain and joy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's a lot of pain and joy. Um, uh, yes, these are like, like, like my babies. Um, and so don't ask which one do you like the most because you can't say you like one baby better than the other. Um, but um, yeah, this, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to write a book. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of struggle. Um, but at the end, when, it, when this comes delivered to my house, then it's, it's like the stork brought this. And it's, it's wonderful. Uh, my, my publishing company, I'm, I've been with two different publishing companies. My first two books, Joker's Club and Looney's, were with a, pub, a small independent publishing company uh, called Journal Stone. And then I moved on with Snowball and Shadow Flicker to uh, 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 still an independent publisher, but uh, a larger one. It's based actually in London, England. And they have, they have a whole staff of people. They have uh, 
proofreaders, copy editors, editors. Uh, they they design the covers. Um, they they do all the shipping of the books and 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 every they have a marketing department. Um, so they so they promote the book uh, both in in the Great Britain, in Canada, and the U.S. Yes, sir. Talk about going from newspaper work to writing novels and securing a publisher. <laughs> Um, yes, well, uh, it's not easy getting published, let me just say that. Um, and I spent years um, uh, searching for, I actually, my first novel, Joker's Club, I actually finished the f uh, first draft in 1989. The book didn't come out until 2011 because I kept, I kept rewriting it and I'd send it out to different publishers or try to get a uh, literary agents interested. And uh, you know, I wasn't having any luck. And uh, every time I'd, I'd go back to it and say, "Well, it, it needs more work," so I'd, I'd work on it some more. And I spent almost on and off 20 years writing that book, not the nine months, <laughs> but uh, but there was there was times when I would you know take years off uh, and just work on like short stories or something, and then go back to the novel and say, "I gotta I gotta get this in better shape." And then and then finally I was. Um, I decided uh, I was going to do one final rewrite on it, and I wasn't going to touch it again until someone wanted to publish it. So I did one final rewrite, and it was actually uh, the first time I actually thought, okay, this book is really, really ready. And at the same time, uh, I had learned about a, uh, this publishing company, Journal Stone, that was just starting out. They wanted to publish sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, and they were having a horror novel contest. And they were looking for horror novels, so I said, "Oh, great! I'll, I'll send that to them." And they were, uh, they were, you know, there's a prize for first place, second place, third place. Um, and before the contest ended, the um, I got an email from the from the publisher, and he said, "You know, can you give me a f call? I want to talk to you about your book." And so I called him, and he said, "Listen, everyone here loves your book." They said, regardless of how it does in the contest, we want to publish it anyway. I said, oh, that's great. And uh, so uh, it ended up coming in second place anyway. But uh, um, so they ended up publishing it. And, um, and then they published my second book. And uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not an easy uh, process. But when I finished my first book, um, I actually had a different manuscript that I sent to my publisher for my second book, and they, they rejected it. So just because they published my first one, I was like, well, I don't, don't, don't really, this one doesn't click. So then I sent them loonies, and, and they, they liked that one. And uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. When I went to uh, Flame Tree Press, which is my British publisher, uh, bef before they published Snowball, I had actually uh, met with the editor at a... a the Horror Writers Association, which is an international organization, they have a convention every year. That's when they hand out the Stoker Awards, which is like the Oscars for horror writers. And uh, I, I was at one of the conventions in Providence, Rhode Island, and the uh, Flame Tree Press was just uh, expanding. Uh, they actually had an offshoot of Flame Tree Publishing, which uh, was a publisher in England that published art books and things like that, but they had they also used to publish uh, anthologies of horror stories, uh, old horror stories like Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft's Bram Stoker stuff. Th their, their anthologies were so popular they decided to start their own imprint, their own line of horror novels. So they were just starting out and I met with the editor and I pitched them uh, a novel that I had written, a manuscript, and uh, they he sounded. He said, "Sounds interesting. You know, send it to me," and um, and I did. And uh, I got a nice rejection letter. Saying, There's a lot I like about this, but you know, I don't think it's quite right. So I said, "Well, I have another manuscript," and that was Snowball. And I sent it to him, and he loved it. And uh, and we signed a contract, and and then he and then followed that up with Shadow Flicker. So. so yeah. I'm <laughs> My mother would say yes. Uh, as a kid, as far back as I can remember, when I was five, six years old, I would I loved watching uh, all those old horror movies on TV, uh, especially in the Halloween season when the, 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 
the TV would, would be in a day with you know all the Universal horror movies, Dracula and Frankenstein, and the, my favorite was the Creature from the Black Lagoon, and uh, so I I um, I devoured those movies, Creature Double Feature every Saturday, uh, watched them endlessly, and then uh, I, and then I would go to the library because people love their library, and I was living in Dover, so I went to the Dover Library and I would take out books, and, and one of the first books I would take out was some of Ray Bradbury's stories. And then, and, and I just loved his stories and his writing, and then I, um, I think one of the, besides Something Wicked This Way Come that made a huge impact on me, the other one was Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I read when I was in junior high, and uh, I was just mesmerized by that book, and um, I just always wanted to, to be a writer. When I was in sixth grade, my uh, class had a my English class had a uh, uh, lesson where we were uh, we were all divided into groups of five people and we were given uh, an opening paragraph and they said write a story based on this opening paragraph so we all sat in our little groups of five and um, my group uh, we couldn't come to a consensus on what was going to happen with this story so the story started out was a group of archaeologists at a dig and the ground opens up and they fall in and what happens. So we just couldn't agree on what was going to happen in this story. So we had to go to the teacher. We said, can we split up and do our own? So the teacher said, sure. So two of them went off to write their story. Two of them off went to do their own. I went off by myself. So I was the only one in the classroom that did it by myself. And then, and then, and then we had an, so I wrote my own story, what I wanted to see happen. And we had um, another classroom judge all the stories, and mine ended up winning the first prize. So I was right. <laughs> and the rest of them were wrong. But that was the very first story I ever wrote, and that was when I was 11. And then after that, I just, uh, anytime I had time, uh, I remember in junior high, anytime I was in the study hall, I wasn't studying, I was writing short stories. So. And what do you think about today's horror movies, like slasher films and all? Is it, it's a whole different. Well, I mean, like, like I said earlier, there's such a broad spectrum of the horror field, and um, there's so many different things, and it's 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 very popular right now in both movies, TV, and books. So everyone's trying to ride this tide, um, but um, there's it's just a great variety, and you can yeah you can see your your basic slasher movies, but there's also some some really nice uh, in depth uh, horror movies and and books that are. There's, there's a huge variety of books out there, and, and movies and TV. Stranger Things is very, you know, of course, huge and, and stuff like that. So it's fun right now, yes. Can, can you, do you ever think of putting together a book with a bunch of short stories? Um, well, here's the thing about short stories. Uh, collections of short stories uh, sell well if you're famous. You know, a collection of Stephen King sto stories can sell. A collection of Greg Bassanelli stories, well, you know, maybe not so much. I would love to do it someday, um, but um, we'll see. Yeah. yeah, I'm showing my age, but were you a fan of Lon Chaney? Do you know who he is? I know, of course I knew who. I used to watch all those movies, both Lon Chaney Sr. and Jr. Um, so, yes, uh, some of the silent movies were, were, were wonderful. I mean, the uh, Phantom of the Opera, the original Phantom of the Opera, uh, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, this, uh, uh, so I used to l like watching even the silent movies. There were there were some wonderful ones that done. So, mm -hmm. any other questions? Do you design the cover? Um, usually, what happens is my publisher will say, um, you know, what would you how, what would you think the cover should look like? And um, so I'd get some suggestions, maybe one or two, three different suggestions, saying, well, I think this might kind of look neat, or this or this. Um, and then the, yeah, the publisher, it's, they, they have the right to design whatever cover they want. They're the ones printing the book and publishing it and, and marketing it. So um, pretty much I've been happy with all my book covers. Um, Snowball, I had 
that was probably the one that's least like any of the suggestions I gave to the publisher. <laughs> but I just love the I love the cover. You know, I gave them a couple ideas and they went and did their own thing, and and I just thought it was you know a really nice subtle yet creepy cover. And then Shadow Flicker, I I, I love that cover, and and that's basically what I told them. I said you know uh, wind turbines overlooking um, a farmhouse, and and that that just looks fantastic. And, Originally, when they originally gave me the artwork uh, in an email, they it was uh, all like black and white grayscale kind of, and they and then I said, yeah, that looks awesome. And then a couple of days later, he said, oh, we got a colored version that I think looks even better. And then I saw that one. I said, oh yeah, I said that one will, like really pop, pop on the newsstand. So, so that book is about um, so the wind turbines. I don't know if you've ever heard of the term shadow flicker, but um, it's a real effect uh, people who live near wind turbines when the sun is up it the rays of the sun go through the the spinning turbines and it creates almost like a strobe like effect and people who live near them m uh, most turbines you, they have to have a certain clearance i think it's about 1000 feet away from any residential home but even people within that you know parameters they still see the feel the effects of it and i went on i went on uh, i had read an article in the boston globe about shadow flicker because there was a bunch of uh, residents in the town in massachusetts who were um trying to get them taken down because they were said that they were ruining their lives and uh so i read that um article and i i said oh i said this this i could do something with this so i kind of filed it away like all writers do when they read something interesting they file it away and i said someday i might just pick this back up and, and do something with it and uh, a lot of them uh some people have um uh, s uh problems sleeping some people get uh headaches um they feel exhausted it's and it, and the the time period the shadow flicker effect lasts depends on how long that sun is behind those twirling uh, blades. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I when I heard about when I read that article, then I went on to YouTube and I actually just Googled uh, shadow flicker, and there's a bunch of people who posted videos, little two minute videos, of the. Uh, shadow flicker in their homes, and uh, and I watched a couple of them. I said, "Oh my!" I could after two minutes, I was like, "This is this is drive me nuts." <laughs> so, anyway, so yes. I was looking, I looked up, and uh, I saw your your book, uh, Jokers, and it had this kind of flickery light. And I was like, oh, "How does he do that?" I didn't realize it's uh, Ralph's light over there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I used to on my laptop. I, I had the the face of the of the Joker, uh, uh, the image on my laptop as my sort of avatar. And uh, I used to turn it on, and I could always it seemed like his eyes would flicker at me, and it would like creep me out. I'd be looking and go, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'd recommend Loonies for you. You like a good murder mystery? <laughs> well. Which one would you say is the closest to a reality? That would be more of my book. Um, I would say Loonies. Okay. And, and, and in fact, Loonies, I, I, Loonies was kind of based on a lot of my years at the newspaper. Um, it's actually, <laughs> I was inspired by a famous case just over the river in Summersworth from the 1980s where I don't know if some of you might some of you might be familiar with but anyway where a family in Summersworth discovered they had a trunk in their basement that a woman had left for them back in like the 1950s and said here can you hold on to this for me and they did and like 25 years later they said well, what are we going to do with this trunk they opened it up and what they discovered inside was pretty grisly and and it spawned this huge, you know, story in the news that's gone on for for years. And and I was inspired by that incident. And I kind of took that idea of what they found in the trunk and kind of created my own own story. But I put a lot of my main character is a newspaper reporter, so I put a lot of my uh, experience of the newspaper and and things, some of the weird things that just went on in this area uh, in that book. Yes. The, the trunk. In the, in the uh, 
story about it is in the Summersworth Historical. Yes, it is. I've seen pictures of it. Yes. Yes, exactly. So you, you can go see that trunk or you can go see this trunk. <laughs> the choice is yours. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. And if you're, if you're interested in purchasing any books, uh, feel free to peruse and, uh, and uh, I'm happy to comment.